beginning of 1974, the word Slade meant only one thing. I said, my, 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 we're all crazy now. Soon, however, Slade was to acquire a new and more significant meaning. It was to become the name of the country's most famous prison. Every week, when you saw that front gate and you heard the voice of the star sentencing himself to five years at Her Majesty's pleasure, you knew you were going to spend the next 30 minutes, and as it turned out, the next 30 years, enjoying what I consider to be Britain's best sitcom, Porridge. And in a packed programme tonight, we shall be talking to a stereo expert about his favourite breakfast, two bowls of Rice Krispies, ten feet apart. <laughs> Your game, milady? Thank you. <laughs> Your nuts, my lord. What sets Ronnie Barker apart was the fact he wasn't just a comedian, he was a great character actor. It's more than just acting, it's, it's becoming a person. And people going to Peter Sellers, like, turning into the people who were playing. But I think that's the same for Ronnie Barker. And I think people sometimes underestimate or underrate the, how, how fantastic that is. Yeah, it's not. Pe -pe 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 <laughs> you know, you could have Arkwright and you could have Norman Stanley Fletcher come into the shop and they could do it and leave, and you'd believe that they were two separate people. Two chalk ices, please. <laughs> And not all of them, I trust. Ronnie Barker is the only actor to star in two of our top ten sitcoms. But the best thing he ever did was porridge. It's a terrible scream, blood curdling. Maybe it's one of your drug addict friends having the cold chicken cure. <laughs> cold turkey. Yeah, well, they use chicken in here, it's cheap, isn't it? He does certain things, he does certain double takes, certain gestures, certain movements, which I have shamelessly stolen. You're a clever bloke, Fletch. That's why I wanted your help, see? If somebody came into the cell that he didn't expect, he would, he would do a jump and then he'd look up. Oh, what a nice surprise, <laughs> Mr. Adam. As if to say, where have they come from? Ronnie was such a generous actor, he never kept all the best gags for himself. Hello, lads. Hello, Red. It's all reason. <laughs> I was new, and I went up to him on the first day and I said, Oh, Ronnie, in this scene, I wonder if we could change this. And he said, Excuse me? I said, Oh, God. So you tried to commit suicide in a supermarket? How? And then I looked and I saw the laughter behind his eyes, and he said, Look, son, he said, There's what's it, something like five laughs in this sequence, three for you and two for me. Does that suit you? Well, I just put my head down and charged the glass doors. <laughs> <laughs> well, what went wrong? The timing is impeccable. It, it, it's spot on every time. And I'm not just talking about like the verbal timing, which he's always been excellent at, but I'm talking about you know, timing with props, the physical comedy. I mean, every element of how to be funny can be learned from watching Ronnie Barker uh, play Fletcher. As far as the public, as far as my profession, as far as my achievement is concerned, Porridge was it. Somebody said to me, we're doing a sitcom set in a prison. I remember thinking then, how do we, how do we get laughs out of this? I didn't think that Porridge would make a very good series. I mean, I just thought it was so grim. Others had their doubts too. In particular, the writers, Dick Clement and Ian Lafrenet. Well, it's not funny, is it? Prison is not we, you know, we went to Brixton and Scrubs and where else? Wandsworth. Wandsworth. And thought, this is awful. Well, I'm in for violence. If somebody upsets you, and they upset you badly, a lot of things you can do in here and get away with. We had a, a drink at the REC club, a sherry, I remember, with the governor of Brixton Prison. Very nice man. Nice sherry. Uh, yes. He said, the most depressing thing about it is the fact that most people inside have given up. There's a few people who are angry and rebellious, but there's far more of them who's basically, you feel that life has defeated them. It didn't give us a laugh. No, it didn't give us a laugh. What they needed was a man on the inside. Somebody like the criminal consultant on A Clockwork Orange, Jonathan Marshall. 
He had been inside prison, I think, for almost as long as he'd been outside prison. And while he was in prison, he'd written this book, How to Survive in the Nick. He said, obviously, most of what prison's about is just this endless, monotonous routine. And what gets them through the day is little victories. Little victories? Yeah. Yeah, told me that. Learning, ain't you? And that little victory might just be getting one extra scoop of potato or getting something over the system. Little victories became the key to putting the comedy into porridge. Here, I forgot to tell you, when you see the doctor, tell him you've got bad feet. <laughs> Why? Well, then you might get your brothel creepers back, see? <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be stuck with prison boots, see? And what might seem trivial when you're outside, in there it is a yes. Suffer from any illness? Bad feet. <laughs> Suffer from any illness? Bad feet. Made a recent visit to a doctor or hospital? Only when we bad feet. Any way of getting a little advantage is highly prized, especially if they can get what they think is a little advantage over the authorities. Are you now, or have you at any time, been a practising homosexual? What were these feet? <laughs> so that little victories is very important to many prisoners. You cannot actually beat the system. You can be clever and manipulate it. And if you haven't got enough brain matter in your head to play the system and you're just going a head-on collision with it, then you lose every time. You can't beat the system, Mr Barakwal. <laughs> it's very difficult to describe Fletcher. Um, the first thing you have to say about him is that he was selfish. Just a minute, I'll have to think about it. That's an insult, isn't it? He'll help people out, but it's usually because there's an ulterior motive. It's usually because he will benefit somewhere himself. Share my toilet roll, gobba. Oh, it's only fair. Look at all these socks I've darned. No, oh, all right. Mind, down you go. The craftiest survives. Fletcher is the craftiest of the lot. All right, Fletcher, just don't let me catch you thieving, that's all. I won't. You want what? <laughs> I won't let you catch me, Mr McCoy. Two words sort of expressed Fletcher for Ian and me. If you'd burst into the room and said, World War Three's just broken out, you'd have said, oh, yes. Oh, he's up on the roof, but he won't come down. Oh, yeah. No, he's threatening to chuck himself over unless we answer his demands. Oh, yeah. In other words, until I see it with my own eyes, I won't believe it. Oh, yeah. But that was a huge key to Fletcher. Nobody was going to put one over on him. He knew whatever angles there were to be had, he had them. I managed to have a look at a memo on his desk. Upside down, of course. But then years of working in the Nick has taught me to read memos upside down, know what I mean? What did it say? It said, Ikifo Emo, late Nitty Flock. <laughs> What they created, which has not been achieved that often in sitcoms, is a complete believable human being. Oh, I just get a bit depressed at times, that's all. Stinking stir. With all the foibles, uh, the pluses and the minuses that, that people have. They created a, a real person and then made him an anti-hero. Originally, Fletch was supposed to look more anti-heroic as well. I've had a sort of heavier eyebrows between the eyebrows, which is, is you know, is the, is the sign of a murderer, actually, isn't it? If your eyebrows are joined, I hope no one's watching this <laughs> whose eyebrows are joined together. You don't have to necessarily be a murderer, but uh, it, often murderers do have this. I have a job to do, and whatever else I am, I am firm, but fair. Eh? I want you to know that I treat you all with equal contempt. He wasn't awful, he wasn't cruel. Uh, he, he was hard, but fair. I absorb it with cool, Celtic calm, and then I relieve my frustrations by making sure that everyone down the line below me suffers. Um? Suffers! It commanded respect anyway, I think, the character. Feet will not touch the floor. Light will be made of misery. <laughs> I am back. And I am in charge here. Even Fletcher, although he would never admit it, I think he had a certain respect for him. And that, those crazy gestures. 
In my episode, somebody talks about Glasgow and he just wants to go. I once boxed for Midlothian boys. Huh? Who against Lanarkshire girls? <laughs> Fulton based the character on a sergeant major that he'd had when he was in the army out in India. Before prison service, you know, Fletcher, I was in the army. I was a drill sergeant in the Argyle and Southern Highlanders. <laughs> Are you like that offstage? No, I don't think so. You no, never I... bully anybody, do no, you? No, no, I wouldn't dare. But in rehearsals, Fulton did share some of Mackay's personality traits. Fulton really was um, an absolute perfectionist. I mean, he wanted to rehearse all the time. My house, my house reflects my wife. Big, is it? Spotless. <laughs> he often had about four, maybe four or five minutes in the show, and he would take up three quarters of the rehearsal time. Poppycock! We would spend ages wondering whether it would be best if he opened the door with his left hand, with his right hand, whether the salt was two inches to the right of the pepper. <laughs> I was in the box once where Sid was shouting, Fulton, get on with it! All right. Fulton wouldn't have heard that, but uh, that was uh, Sid letting off steam. Eventually, I had to say to uh, Fulton, I said, I've, I've got quite a lot in this. I must rehearse it. I must rehearse it. Because, well, just do it once more. Just, just, just go once more. So we did. Ow, <laughs> oh, Mr. Mackay! His rehearsing was as ainly retentive and as particular and mincing and difficult <laughs> as his performance. To move! Yes, you! It was kind of wonderful in a way. I mean, in a sense, the way that Fulton rehearsed used to drive everybody mad but it also created what happened in the show. People getting irritated and frustrated by him in the rehearsal room would be irritated and frustrated by him in the performance because it was the same. Back to yourself, move! Me and my friend Michael always laugh at Brian Wilde because he's just like this great Arthur Askey on stilts. And he says that. But you see that screw there, that tall one standing up, that tall one, eh? Barraclough. Looks like Arthur Askey on stilts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got, I've got him like that, see? Patty in my hands, he. If you got a problem, don't care what it is. If you need a hand, I can assure you this. I can help. Barraclough is the nicest man in the world. I well, think of all of you locked in these little cells, and I, I think of me going out of here and well, going home, you know, to my little house and my wife. Sometimes a miserable character, somebody who's lugubrious, you can get a lot of fun out of. <laughs> What's the matter, Mr. Bearclough? I sometimes wish I was in here with you lot. <laughs> Certainly, Fletcher could exploit him in, in totally a a different way to the way he had to deal with Mackay. It's their different approaches that provides the comedy between Mackay and Barraclough. Barraclough was supposed to represent the, the new face of social work in the prison service. Oh, well, I've always thought that the way to encourage trust was to show trust. The criminals, man! Then he's always, I think we should give them a chance. Let them learn that they can always, and he's a like, never! No, they should be punished! And you trusted them. Now, what have I just told you? Once you turn your back on them, you're finished. You do feel as though, like, if Mackay wasn't there, then everyone would escape. In fact, he'd probably, like, open the door and let them all out. You better search this, ain't you? She might have put half a pound of ashes in there. Go on, search. Go on. <laughs> There's no need to adopt that attitude, Fletcher. You knew, really, that they were both hopeless characters in themselves. I mean, they were both as trapped by the Slade prison as the prisoners. <laughs> I seem to have mislaid my pen. Where's my wallet? <laughs> I've been mugged. <laughs> possible, sir. We've only been here a minute. I mean, we, we came in about... A, a... Likely Lads creators Clement and Lafrené were asked to write two of the pilots. One was called Prisoner and Escort. It was when he'd been arrested, he was being taken up to the north to be incarcerated. 
if that's the right word. I hope it is. <laughs> Not that word. 